And we make the final jump to the last part, which is, this is all very nice to be able to do hypothesis testing by bootstrapping, but it also, as all methods, has its limitation. Because here, when we do bootstrapping and we do hypothesis testing by computing the confidence intervals, it means that we should know which thing that we are doing a confidence interval for. And if we have many things in play, that is, for instance, a comparison of uh, many different groups, which we'll get back to in this course, we haven't touched on it so much, then we need another way to do hypothesis testing by simulation. The final thing, and that is actually not called bootstrap anymore, then we call it permutation testing. But it's also a resampling technique, a, a technique that does not assume, that's why you were smiling, because you knew I was the wrong place there, but this is because it looks like this one. So I thought I was there, right? And I'm going to do the final thing, the hypothesis testing using permutation test. I, I give it to you now in the setting of two groups, but the reason why we do it, because it's a method that easily extends to five or ten group situation that I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks with that situation. The confidence, I mean, then we cannot just take one thing and subtract the other thing and do bootstrapping and get a confidence interval because there is not only one or two things in play, there are many things in play simultaneously, many groups in play. What could we do then? Well, here's one way of handling that. Presented in the two-group setting, right? Presented in the two-group setting. Instead of doing the resampling of, from each of the two groups, we put in... the data in one pool, so we join the data uh, from the two groups, and then we shuffle it and split it into two groups again. That is the permutation. This is what we do here. Many times, and, and we, we shuffle it in the group sizes that they come in, so if I have 10 in one and 20 in another, I, I put the 30 data points in one uh, pool, I shuffle them, and I split them in a 10, 20 again. So I'm not sampling with replacement now. You could say it's a kind of sampling without replacement, and then you could call it a permutation. I just shuffle around the group membership, you could say, of the data. And then I many times shuffle around and see what happens. And the idea is that if the original difference between the two groups is much larger than what you see when you shuffle things around, then it's because they are really different. And the other way around is, if the observed difference between the two groups is really not different from what you see when you shuffle things around, when you per permute the data, then it means that the groups are really not different. It's a basic sort of simple, naive idea without using any assumptions of the distribution of the data, just using, in a way, common sense, and then seeing what happens. So I do this many times. I calculate the difference in this two-group situation. Otherwise, there would be another statistic I would have to calculate, and this is what I treat, I'd, I'd tell you next time. I would have to do something else if I had k groups, but here I can still do the two-group thing that I many times compute the group difference. One, two. And then I do, like I a little confusingly did before, um, I find a p-value from this distribution of possible outcomes of permutations, be it one or the other tail, or a double tail, or one tail times two. Uh, I call this the usual manner, and it's also confusing when we are looking at the t or the normal. I realize to, to keep our tongues uh, straight in our mouth, to be able to keep track of the one and two, two tail thing. But this is, a not, this is the same challenge here as it is in the classical setting. Um, so this is the permutation test. The, here is how it looks in R, also very sim simply done. Here's the data again. I was not in R. Here's the data. I have a 100,000K. 
Look at how easily we can do this. We can sample directly from the joint data set. This is a way in R to make the joint list of the joint data set to, to use the C, con concatenate. Here is the joint data set. I sample from this joint data set. And when I don't write any, the default option for the sample function is to do it without replacement, which means that this is simply a permutation of the data. It's just shuffling the data. The same, I think we have 19 data points here, it's the same 19 data points shuffled. And then I just make the split. I know I, I should split it in a 10-9, so I'm, I decide I take the first nine to group one and the last 10 to group two, or whatever the nine and the 10 is belonging to. That's what I'm doing in the second step here. I use the first nine to group one, as I said, and the last 10 to group two each time. And then I compute all the means, and I count how many times the absolute mean diff is above this one. Is above the observed absolute mean. I have the original absolute mean, and I compare all the new computed means, the difference of means with the one I had originally. And if it's uh, sort of odd in that direction, and it is, or at least on the limit, I would reject the null hypothesis of them being the same. Doing it the proper one-tailed, two-tailed, or double, two, uh, one or two-tailed way. That was it, yet, ladies and gentlemen. You were given two tools or one major tool for statistics today, the bootstrapping. You were also given simulation tools more generally as a computational tool for probability systems. And then we touched on that we can use some of these ideas also for sort of error propagation, finding variances. The basic new thing you saw was that there is a formula for finding the approximate variance of a nonlinear function of, of stuff, uh, which was a new thing. Alternative to simulation, that's the thing why it came up here. That's it for today. Uh, enjoy it. And then uh, we have two more interesting things in this course. So uh, please come back. <laughs>